Yeah. Oh yeah, we've makes had shit loads of that. Dusty. Okay, at this time I want to call the the Wyoming Game and Fish Commission uh, meeting today. It's April nineteenth. At this time, I want to take a, a roll call on the commissioners. Uh, district number five, uh, Commissioner Ashley Lundvall. Present. Uh, district number one, Commissioner Mark Jolovich. Here. Uh, Commissioner number, district number six, Commissioner Richard Ladwig. Here. District number two, uh, Commissioner Ralph Brokaw. Here. District number seven, uh, Commissioner Galen Bird. Here. District number four, uh, Commissioner Pete Doobie. Present. And I'm Ken Roberts for district number three. That um, I note that all uh, members are present. And so therefore we have a quorum. Um, at this time, if I could get everybody to stand, we'll pledge allegiance to the flag. Thank you. Um, preliminary to those watching via Zoom, if you do not send in an advanced comment sheet prior to the start of the meeting, but would still like to comment on the agenda items, please do one of the following. If you are on Zoom via your computer, you can send a chat to the host with your name and the agenda item you wish to comment on. If you're listening on phone, you can send an email to WGFVIDEO at Wyoming.gov, which is Wyoming Game Fish video. Uh, make sure to include your name, phone number uh, that you're calling from, and the agenda item you wish, wish to comment on. Um, so, therefore, uh, next item will be uh, minutes. We're going to approve the last minutes from the last uh, public uh, session. Uh, been, does anybody have any corrections to the minutes? No, sir. With no corrections to the minutes. I would ask uh, if we would approve. We have a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Commissioner Bird has motioned it. Commissioner Doobie has seconded it for, to approve the minutes. Do I hear any discussion? Okay. That. Um, uh, we vote on it. All those in favor, aye. 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 Uh, the motion is adopted, um, and we'll go forth. Um, I believe at this time that we need to go. We will be. Um, Mr. Director Nesvik. Good morning, Mr. President, members of the commission. Um, I've got just a few updates here this morning. Um, first of all, I just wanted to, uh, you're gonna have the opportunity to hear, to, to see today the fruits of the labor from both uh, our folks on the game and fish team and, and lots of members of the public from across the state and their work over this last two or three months to collect a lot of information and analyze it and, and put it into a, uh, a set of season recommendations that uh, that I think you'll be quite proud of. They've done a lot of hard work on this, and and uh, there's been significant uh, interest in season setting this year for sure. We continue to be concerned about drought in different, I guess, at different scales across the state. Some parts of the state are in, in severe drought conditions, and others not quite so bad. But you know, for a, for many parts of the state, this will be two or three years in a row of of drought if things don't change here in the next month or month and a half. And so um, be rest assured, we're continuing to watch that, monitor that and evaluate potential impacts on wildlife. Um, we've done quite a bit of work here recently, Angie and I, with the Wyoming Department of Transportation regarding wildlife crossings and kind of how we go about the, the logistics and the fiscal allocations for, um, for purchasing and for doing the construction, the planning, the engineering, and all the things associated with putting together or putting on the ground one of those wildlife crossing projects. As you know, in the past, there's been um, 
kind of piecemeal approaches with um, sometimes we've had um, strong commitments from the YDOT commission on pots of money that'll be allocated to a crossing and sometimes not, not as much. The thing that I think we have right now is a plan that we're working through where YDOT is going to have a committed amount of money that they're going to contribute to wildlife crossings. That'll be predictable for five years. Um, and and we, we're working out a pretty good process, I think, to give us some, some good predictability. We've agreed on the common um, priorities right now being obviously getting, getting across the finish line with getting a bid out for I-25 KC to Buffalo. But, but then the next three are uh, Kemmer, the Kemmer project. Um, and there's a particular new sense of urgency there with the, um, the announcement of the power plant, the nuclear power plant that'll be constructed and all the increase in traffic there. Um, so that project is in the top three, as is the, the Dubois Crossing project, which I think we've um, talked with all of you about before, and then um, Halleck Ridge. The infrastructure bill did have 350 million in it, specifically for wildlife crossing projects. We intend to work with YDOT to apply for um, two grants out of that money to fund two of those projects that I just talked about. We've had significant private fundraising recently. The Wildlife Fund has been um, out front and center on, on raising private funds, but we've had um, other interests um, and, and, it, and it looks good as far as being able to fund those, at least the top two. Halleck Ridge is a little bit more of a challenge until we know more about any grants we may get um, because it's so expensive. But, but anyway, I wanted you to know that uh, crossings continue to be worked and um, I think we're refining our, the way that we work with YDOT to make those things happen. We have um, Expo here, in-person Expo and Casper coming up here in a few weeks. I encourage any of you that can go to attend. Um, it's a pretty good opportunity to see a lot of our folks, our field people um, out on the ground teaching their particular trade, whatever it may be, and, and get to see a lot of kids that are um, actively learning cool stuff about the outdoors. Um, there will be on the Thursday night of Expo, there will be a um, volunteer appreciation night. And certainly if any of you are there, we'd, we'd love to have you at that. It'll be, I believe, we'll get you the details. I don't even want to speak on where it is because like, I don't want to say it wrong. Um, we do have, we haven't had a Wyoming Wildlife Task Force meeting since the last commission meeting. So I don't have an, uh, an update for you today, but we do have um, our next meeting coming up here at the end of the month for Commissioner Doobie and I, I believe it's April 28th. Um, Travel Recreation Wildlife, uh, the Joint Committee of the Legislature has um, established their interim study topics and their first meeting will be May 9th in Casper. It will include a tour of the Spies Fish Hatchery as well as um, a series of other topics that, uh, that they, both they and us are interested in, in discussing. Our number one recommendation for them was to um, consider the, the last recommendation that came from the task force regarding preference points and, and bonus points. And that is on the list. Uh, last thing I wanted to mention is, is that uh, the first um, big wildlife crossing project that we had done in a number of years um, where we received the build grant um, over at Dry Piney, that construct, construction will begin on that here shortly. The, the kickoff for that project um, actual on the ground work is is May 10th over um, over there on the on the project site. Um, certainly, Commissioner Roberts is close there, and um, be great if he could attend. And I, I think he's planning on it. And then any other commissioners would certainly be welcome to come over and and celebrate the kickoff of that uh, multi million dollar twenty. I think it's up to twenty one million dollar um, underpass and fencing project, and in one of, right in the middle of one of our keystone deer herds in the state. So with that, Mr. President, I would stand for any questions that you or the members of the commission may have. Any questions, thanks. Next, we'll move on to item number three and Hank Edwards, Wildlife Health Laboratory, uh, Supervisor Dr. Samantha Allen, uh, State Wildlife veterinarian and Justin Bedford on Casper Wildlife Management. President Roberts, members of the commission, Director Nesvik, 
Um, good morning. I uh, drew the short straw and ended up here in front of you to talk about chronic waste and disease. Um, I put together a short presentation. The first part of it is going to be kind of a basics of the disease that can hopefully serve as a refresher uh, for some members of the commission, as well as we have member, several new members of the commission. So hopefully you'll find this, this useful. Then I'll move on to some of our findings uh, from this year's surveillance effort. Then I'll wrap up with where we're headed in 2022. So first off, what is it? Chronic waste and disease is a fatal nervous system disease of white-tailed deer, mule deer, elk, moose, and of course, reindeer or caribou. Causative agent is a prion or infectious protein. And of course, there's several different uh, prion diseases of animals. It's not just mad cow or scrapie and sheep, but humans also have their own crutzfeld jakob disease, Kuru, and of course, there's others. This obviously is not just a problem in Wyoming or Colorado. This disease was just recently discovered in North Carolina, and that's the 30th state where CWD has identified in um, wild cervids. It's also been found in um, four Canadian provinces, as well as Norway, Finland, South Korea, and Sweden. So this is a worldwide problem, right? This is not just a Wyoming problem. So back to a prion. What exactly is a prion? Um, a prion is simply an abnormal shape or a form of a normal protein that happens to be predominant in nervous system cells. And when that protein takes on that different shape, it becomes incredibly difficult for the body to get rid of it as it would as it moves on through new proteins. And as it gets rid of those old proteins, it can't do that with these, with these prions. So they build up and they build up. And as they build up, they cause death in um, cells of the, of the central nervous system. So as more and more of these cells die, then the animal slowly develops those, those clinical signs that we associate with chronic wasting disease, including weight loss, drooling, behavioral changes, hair coat changes, droopy ears, lack of general awareness, right? The lights are on, but nobody's home. Um, but those signs don't show up until the last four to eight weeks of the disease. They can have the disease from the time they're infected to this until the clinical signs appear can be a year and a half to two or even up to four years. So, um, and they'll test strong positive on our, on our tests, but they'll still have no outward signs of CWD. They'll be in good shape. With, with, with none of these clinical signs. In fact, most of the hunter harvested animals appear completely normal and still be CWD positive. CWD is transmitted both animal to animal as well as environment to animal. Uh, animals become in, infected when they come in contact or ingest contaminated soil plants uh, or hay that's contaminated with saliva, urine, or feces from an infected animal. They can also come in contact with um, contaminated surfaces like mineral licks, feeders, troughs, et cetera. And we also know that carcasses can serve as a source of transmission. So carcasses have a lot of prions. And even after those carcasses are decomposed completely, um, that, that uh, site on the landscape where that, that carcass decomposed will have a lot of prions that are available for other deer uh, as they come in contact with it. And of course, that's the big worry. And that's what makes CWD so much different than other diseases is that the prions can persist in the environment for a long period of time. It's been shown with scrapie that it's at least 16 years. So um, that's what makes this disease so tough to deal with. We know that um, CWD is more prevalent in males than it is in females, basically on, by a, a twofold scale. And we know that CWD is prevalence is higher in prime age animals. The same is true for elk, but it tends to infect the prime age as opposed to the young or the very old. And, um, but there's no differences in prevalence between sexes in elk. Both, both cows and bulls have an equal chance of having CWD. But genetics does influence the length of that incubation time or the, the length from the time an animal is infected until they die of CWD. 
but we know that most, most deer will die within two years and most elk will die in about four years. No true resistance has been identified and there's no documented immunity or recovery. And the worry is that those animals that do survive for an extended period of time are shedding those prions on the landscape. Um, mountain lions have been shown to selectively prey on CWD infected animals and modeling suggests that wolf predation may actually decrease CWD prevalence if they are able to um, identify those prime age animals that are likely infected with CWD. As far as CWD and human health, there's a lot of research out there to support that there's probably a pretty substantial species barrier that prevents this disease from going to humans, but that barrier is probably not absolute. And that's because of an, an ongoing study that reported the transmission of CWD to macaques that were fed uh, CWD positive game meat. Unfortunately, that study is still not out. We're still waiting for that to be published and reviewed. So um, we just keep looking for that. In addition, the public health has continued to monitor um, uh, human prion disease and try and link that with ingestion of game meat. And to date, there's been no link established. Nonetheless, the uh, CDC and the World Health Organization recommend that CWD positive animals not be consumed, right? Because we know that prions are not inactivated by cooking and the CDC and World Health Organization feel that it's best just to minimize your exposure to prions. So don't eat those positive animals. For those sportsmen who have been unfortunate enough to harvest a CWD positive animal, um, that butchering equipment can be disinfected simply by putting it in a 40% bleach solution for at least five minutes. So there are ways to inactivate the, the prion and, and bleach works pretty well. So what about CWD in Wyoming? Um, we had documented it in the southeastern corner of the state in 1985, and we began pretty intensive surveillance in the late 90s and early 2000s. And since that time, we've looked at almost 80,000 samples. Uh, during that, over those 25 years, uh, we have seen this disease slowly infect our deer herds, where it is now infects 34 of 37 deer herds and is found in 15 of our 36 elk herds. Because this disease is so widespread in the state, we've shifted our uh, surveillance program from a detection where we used to follow that leading edge of the disease uh, to more of monitoring the disease across the entire state. So now we're just simply monitoring prevalence and we do that by um, a five-year rotation and so every herd or most herds will be sampled every five years. And we do that by having each region focus on between one and two deer herds and one, and two, one or two elk herds within each region each year. Our goal is to get 200 samples from each herd unit. And that of course gives us a, a statistically significant sample size where we have some confidence on our prevalence estimates. Our surveillance is geared towards adult bucks and adult elk, both sexes. Um, and those 200 samples need to be collected within one to three years. We'll continue our annual surveillance in CWD negative hunt areas. Again, trying to document for our sportsmen where this disease occurs and where it does not occur. Uh, testing is provided free across the state and generally our laboratory turns those samples around in less than three weeks. Actually, we're able to turn those samples around in usually less than, less than a week, but it does take time for those samples to make it to the lab, of course. So at presently, we are doing all of our tissue processing and tissue logging and all the things we do when those samples first show up. We do all that at the Laramie Regional Office in the um, Fish Health and Forensics Laboratory. And then once those tissues are processed, we move those across the interstate where they're tested um, in the Wildlife Health Laboratory. I won't go through and read each one of these, but just suffice it to say that each region, each of the eight regions, had took on between two and four uh, herds each year, or in 2021. And um, I'll show you those results here in just a minute. So once all the dust settled from this year's surveillance, it ended up we tested 6,884 samples 
The vast majority of those were mule deer with 2,972, um, just over 1,600 white-tailed deer, uh, 2,156 elk, and 97 moose. <coughs> CWD was identified in several new deer areas. Um, as you can see there, unfortunately, I can't quite read that, but you can see all those um, new deer areas. Most of those, of course, were in the western part of the state. And then um, that area that is shown in, with the stripes, that is uh, actually discovered in 2022, but it was just after the first of the year, so I've included it here. And then followed by uh, five new elk areas. You can see they were more scattered across the state, particularly up around the Black Hills, but of course there was uh, that sample that was over by Pinedale as well. So this is a little hard to see with the lighting, but um, that big purple Pac-Man shape, that's, that's the, the representing the number of samples that were collected by the Wildlife Division. And that makes sense, right? That's our field personnel that are out in the field and they're collecting the vast majority of those samples. But if you look at that next largest pie piece, that's actually submitted by hunters. So we're seeing the number of samples collected by hunters continue to grow. So we have that uh, video on our website on how to collect samples. We also have um, CWD collection kits that are free in our district offices. And we're seeing hunters take advantage of that more and more. There's a whole list of different slices of the pie you can see. So you can imagine that our samples come from a variety of sources, including the federal government. So that would be the National Elk Refuge, and um, um, the Grand Teton National Park, they collect a lot of samples, as well as several different divisions across the department, fisheries and uh, et cetera, collect a lot of samples in addition to taxidermists and just all kinds of sources. Here's some interesting tidbits from some of our surveillance. As you can see in the upper left-hand corner, that's the number of samples that we've tested this year. And this, this is more samples than we've ever tested before. And you can see since 2016, the demand for laboratory testing has continued to increase. Um, if you move over to the next uh, upper graph, that is the number of positives um, uh, by, uh, I'm sorry, that's a number of samples that were submitted by surveillance type. So you can see the vast majority of those are hunter kill followed by uh, road kill in the, in the light blue, and then finally uh, targeted animals. So targeted animals are those animals that are usually are identified by field personnel and they're usually uh, found dead or they're uh, a sick or, or thin looking animal. So they're targeted for surveillance because they're more likely to have CWD. So moving on to the, to the lower left, um, you can see that's the number of positive samples that were submitted by surveillance type. So obviously the vast majority of those are going to be hunter killed, followed by road killed, and then finally targeted. And generally 11% of our hunter killed um, uh, animals were positive, 12% of our road killed animals were positive, and 36% of our targeted animals were positive. Moving on to the final graph uh, in the lower right, that's CWD positive by species. And as you can imagine, the vast majority of those um, are mule deer, followed by white-tailed deer, and then finally elk. And generally, 16% of our hunter-killed um, mule deer were positive, 22% of our white-tailed deer were positive, and finally 2% of our elk were CWD positive. As far as how did our uh, targeted uh, herd units do for 2021, out of the 12 mule deer and one white-tailed deer herd units, Six completed their three-year rotation with at least 200 samples. Three, uh, three of those herd units completed their three-year rotation with at least 85% of their sample go goals. And then uh, finally, four uh, of those herd units will continue surveillance in 2022. Similar findings in elk were four. Uh, herd units were completed their three-year rotation with at least 200 samples. One with 95% of that sample goal. And then finally, three will continue on in 2022 to reach that 200, that 200 goal. So 
I'm not going to show you all the prevalences from all the targeted herd units because your eyes would glaze over quickly. So I'm just going to hit some of the high points just to give you an idea of what our prevalences are across the state. So the, the sublet herd unit um, uh, was 0.9% with 329 samples, very respectable. Um, Paint Rock is 18.4, North Bighorn at 12%. The project uh, herd unit uh, is our highest prevalence in the state right now at 66%. Uh, Sweetwater at 5%, uh, Sheep Mountain at 15% with 170 samples. And finally, Whitetail Deer in the Black Hill, two, in the Black Hills, uh, 270 samples uh, sitting at 7% prevalence. So if we look at this in a little more detail, because obviously we're keeping track of more than just CWD prevalence in mule deer bucks. So this is an example of um, the project herd, the Shoshone River, the North Bighorn, broken down by adult male mule deer, adult female mule deer, adult male whitetails, and adult female whitetail deers. The only reason I throw this up here is to give you an idea that every herd responds to CWD a little bit differently. You can't take and, and paint a broad brush about exactly how, how all these herds respond. So look at the project herd, which I mentioned earlier. The, the prevalence in, in white-tailed buck or mule deer bucks is 66%. But if you look at prevalence in adult female mule deer and female and a and male white-tailed deer, it's all about 20, 24%. Compare that to the Shoshone River. Again, we do see a higher prevalence in mule deer bucks, uh, only 13% in females, but the prevalence in male white-tailed deer is pretty similar to uh, mule deer at 28%. And of course, adult females are just half of that. Compare that to the North Bighorn, you see that prevalence in males and female mule deer is very similar. 12 and 13%, but look at the white-tailed deer, uh, prevalence of 25% in males and 14% in females with very good sample sizes. But of course we don't have perfect sample sizes across the board, right? Not all of our doe, uh, doe samples are reaching 200 and even many of our white tails aren't. I just throw this up here so you have an idea of how CWD can, can be different across different herd units. As far as elk goes, of course, we sample a boatload of elk off the National Elk Refuge, Grand Teton National Park. Last three years, we've looked at 815 elk. One of those was positive, and that was last year. So of course, our prevalence is very low. Laramie Peak, we're sitting at about 300 samples, 5% prevalence. Iron Mountain, 250 samples, sitting at 14% prevalence. These are prevalence maps that we just recently have redone. Uh, these are now on the website and available um, for sportsmen. This is mule deer, and you can see those areas with the darkest blue are the highest prevalence. Those with the lightest blue are um, actually where CWD has not been detected. Those areas that are gray are areas where we have um, detected CWD, but we've not gotten enough samples to have a good estimate of prevalence. Those areas that are shaded with the, with the red stripes are, are areas where we have neither identified CWD, nor have we gotten enough samples to have confidence that it exists there or it does not exist there. Same is true for elk. The light blue um, on the far western side are where we have not identified CWD and we have good sample sizes. Those that are straight gray are, are where we've identified it, but um, uh, we don't have a good sample size yet. And then, um, of course, it's just like the, the mule deer map. Those that are striped are where we do not have sufficient samples to say it exists or it does not exist. But same story, um, the dark blue is the highest prevalence, up to 15% on this map. And then um, uh, the light blue is the lighter prevalence. Again, these are on our website now and available to, um, to hunters. Last two slides are just where we're headed in 2022. Um, these are mule deer herd units. You can see there'll be the Black Hills. We'll hit southeastern Wyoming with the Laramie Mountains and um, uh, North Converse, South Converse, I mean. And then of course, we'll hit the Wyoming range and the sublet herds, as well as uh, the project and the Grable River. 
Moving on to elk, you can see it's kind of the same basic story, southeastern Wyoming, a lot on the western side of the state, and as well as some up in the Bighorn Basin. And that's all I have. I'm happy to entertain any questions you may have. Any questions? Mr. President? Yes. How did the, uh, the project go? And I think it's in the Lander area where we had mandatory testing this year. How, how did that go over? Or Justin, can you? Yeah, um, is somebody from Lander here who can address that question better than I can? I was just curious how the the testing on the, the couple lander areas where we had mandatory testing this past year, I believe, just how that went and yeah, Commissioner, any other general information? Director Nesvik, we did mandatory sampling in the Sweetwater herd unit, which was hunt areas 96 and 97, and it went really well. We had high hunter cooperation. In fact, we had hunters um, seeking us out. So I think mandatory check went extraordinarily well. We came within five samples of reaching our goal and as you saw the the, pro, the prevalence rate was um five percent i think hank said so it went well it went really well we intend to do it again this year in in the project herd unit where we're going to continue to focus both research and monitoring so the public the hunters were responsive to it oh, and very. They had no problems with it none none and most hunters that our field personnel talk to we're well informed, so the plan that we had in place to get people aware that mandatory check was required worked. Good, worked really well. Mr. President, we know how bad chronic wasting is. What is the general public perception of the severity of chronic wasting? Does, do the, does the general public know that it's as bad as it really is? President Robert, uh, Commissioner Djokovic, I, that is a really good question. Um, and I guess it all depends on whether that hunter received a positive result on his animal or not. I think generally, in my experience, most people are not aware of the extent of CWD and in some areas, the likelihood of getting a CWD positive animal harvested. Some people do pay attention, certainly. Some people uh, pay attention to our website where we have a ton of information, but it's the same story. It's just really difficult to reach out to public and get everybody up to speed. Thank you. Mr. President, uh, is there any, Hank, is there any new and exciting groundbreaking type research or, or anything going on in the worldwide regarding CWD? President Roberts, Commissioner Duby, um, Sam is going to cover that. She's going to okay. cover some of the, the most recent uh, research. But yeah, I think that things are moving on and Sam will cover this to where the testing is getting better. And quite honestly, now that this is a problem that's beyond Wyoming and Colorado, there's a lot more players that are involved. So there's, there's more people that are working on finding solutions um, to the disease. Okay, I'll Thank turn you. it over to Justin. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Morning, Mr. President. Oh, Mr. President, <laughs> Director Nesbick, members of the commission. Um, Guess we'll get that. We'll wait for my presentation to load here, but um, so I'm gonna, I guess while we're waiting for that, I wanna talk to you guys a little bit. Some of you sitting here got the pleasure of listening to me for almost three hours a couple of years ago as we presented the CWD management plan. And, you know, that was, that was kind of a long afternoon. Ultimately it culminated in, in you guys adopting our plan. So, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go over the plan in, in, in its entirety, but given some of the turnover on the commission, I, I felt it was worthwhile to at least bring up some of the highlights and, and some of the main tenets of the plan. So, so um, with respect to herd management and CWD research, so point in there. Okay. Oh, 
Okay, so why are we here? So the main reason why we're here is, is obviously the recognition of the problem. And then beginning back in 2018, the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies came out with a suite of recommendations to start tackling the CWD issue and, and begin exploring of going down the road of, of actually trying to manage this disease. So they came out with three basic tenets in, in their, their recommendations, and that is where we can reduce artificial points of, of cervid concentration. And when I say cervids, I mean members of the deer family, which, which get CWD. So we're talking in Wyoming, white-tailed deer, mule deer, elk, and to a much lesser extent, moose. Um, and then the, the next strategy would be to where it makes sense, increase harvest, which, in, which could include either buck harvest or even density reductions. And then also increase harvest in these hot spot areas. One thing we know about CWD is it tends to localize in areas and, and wherever we have it well established, we tend to see these, these real hot spots emerge, um, especially in places like irrigated fields, agricultural areas, places where, where deer um, inhabit habitats year round. So, so basically this kicked off a long-term intensive collaborative process where we convened a stakeholder working group and we had 31 members and we met over the course of nearly two years. We, we processed a ton of information, gave a ton of, of presentations to this body um, about routine management, disease ecology, um, et cetera, et cetera. And that ultimately culminated in us developing the plan and you guys formally adopting it. And, and I guess one of the things that really emerged throughout all this is, is that we all recognize there's a lot of unknowns with chronic wasting disease. Um, but there's also an awful lot that we do know now. And, and we really felt like as an agency that it's incumbent upon us as wildlife managers to begin to explore ways to manage this disease. Um, you know, it's fair to say, you know, since this disease was discovered in free ranging deer in 1985, you know, in Wyoming, we really didn't do much in the way of actual disease management um, with respect to trying to implement strategies to reduce or at least maintain prevalence. So, we didn't really do much for, for the next 30 some years and, and just kind of felt like we we're getting a little bit behind the eight ball. And as we saw, as, as Hank pointed out, this disease inevitably marched across the landscape in Wyoming. It's increased in both distribution and, and prevalence um, that we felt like it was really time to do something. And, and so one of, the, one of the other things we did within the collaborative process is we commissioned, and this may get to Commissioner Jolovich's question a little bit too, but we did commission um, a pretty intensive public survey in 2019. And, and one of the results that was the most telling to us when, when this public survey was conducted was that, it was that doing nothing was basically no longer acceptable. And, which, you know, and doing nothing is a decision. And it's one that we collectively, maybe without necessarily thinking about it, made for almost 30 years and, and feel like you know, the time is now to, to begin to act. And so, so with that 2019 hunter survey, I won't go into all the details, but just real quickly, we surveyed 3,000 hunters, 2,000 residents and 1,000 non-residents. And then those respondents were broken out by whether or not they hunted in high prevalence areas or low prevalence areas. And we define that as a high prevalence area if, if that had 10% or more based on the current data at the time and low prevalence was 5% was or less. And as what we found, and we tried to just gauge their responses, like how concerned are you about CWD? What are acceptable courses of action for us to implement to manage this disease? And as what we found was there's actually fairly little difference in responses between those that purported to hunt in high versus low prevalence areas. Um, uh, I guess as you would expect, most of the concern that was borne out in the results was just, was the potential for this disease to impact long-term future hunting opportunities. And, and also a large majority of those respondents, you know, agreed that we should take measures to reduce CWD. And interestingly, you know, taking no action was the most unacceptable decision when we asked, when we asked them that. So, so of, of those potential management actions that we, that we um, gave them a suite of options to pick from, the most acceptable was the utilization of special hunts to remove deer in localized areas. And that was followed by reducing total populations and then by increasing number of late season buck licenses. Um, and the vast majority of hunters also indicated that we should strike a prior, you know, priority should be to strike a balance between controlling CWD and also preserving hunting opportunities. 
so you know throughout the throughout this collaborative process I, I think the department was very clear and upfront with folks about things that we do know about this disease and things that we don't and that's one of the scary things about going down the road of, of managing chronic wasting diseases there's still some unknowns and specifically some unknowns as to whether or not some of these strategies will work over the long term and be successful in either reducing prevalence or at least maintaining it or preventing it from going up. But as, as science has emerged and as Hank attested to with more and more folks working on it, there's a lot of things that we do not now know about this disease. And there is some certainty with some of this, nothing in nature is absolute, but these are some things that are borne out time and time again. And we know now that where we have this disease sustained for a long enough period of time and prevalences get to a, to a high enough level that populations are actually being impacted. Um, we feel like CWD is an additive source of mortality, meaning we're actually losing more animals to this disease than, than we would otherwise lose throughout the course of a, of a normal year. Um, we know this disease is expanding in both distribution and prevalence. We know that in the vast majority of cases, um, the prevalence in bucks and especially prime age bucks is nearly double that of does and in some cases even higher. We know that prevalence is highest in mature bucks. Again, this some of Hank went over this and prevalence in, in white-tailed deer can meet and exceed that of mule deer. Um, we know that prevalence is likely, uh, um, or excuse me, in environmental transmission probably likely plays a much larger role where this disease has been longer established. So at the beginning stages as this disease new, moves to a new herd, it's likely most of the transmission is from animal to animal, but as it becomes well entrenched and established, you have environmental contamination and other things. And so there's a good chance that environmental transmission plays a much larger role. We know that prevalence of this disease doesn't vary substantially in elk and that, and that elk using the same areas or overlapping elk herds where we have this disease well established in our deer herds is nowhere near as high typically. Um, a good example is our Laramie Peak elk herd where we've had it long established where long term our prevalence of this disease runs, depending on the years you look anywhere from 25 to, to 40 plus percent in our mule deer and, and yet in our elk the long term prevalence is about 6%. So, although it is true to say that there's little concrete just published data from, from long term experiments that definitively says these course of management actions absolutely will work. In the absence of that, we do know a lot of these things and we have enough information about this disease to really warrant some level of action. So what are the disease management strategies? So, so one of the things that we've committed to in the plan is where we're gonna embark on significant management strategies that may be like an elevated um, hunter harvest or buck harvest or things like that is we, intend to utilize a BACI design. And BACI is just a before after control impact. So it's a fancy way of saying we're gonna measure our baseline um, prevalence of this disease, herd demographics, things like that. Then we're gonna implement a treatment, which may be some form of hunting season or, or whatever it may be. And then we're gonna evaluate those results. And we're gonna learn and adapt our management over time based on those. And so where we are, where we do intend to employ these management actions, um, you know, we tend to use, we, we intend to use the best available data in science and also, you know, practices that are grounded in acceptable wildlife management. Um, so again, some of these actions are experimental in nature, but we think they're worth trying. And we really tried to highlight the need for broad and diverse public support to, to, before we implement these actions. And, and I think you guys will hear a little bit later today um, and, and as evidenced by some of the hunter comments you guys may have, have read based on some proposed seasons this year, you know, that's a tricky thing for us uh, as far as how we define that. I mean, absolutely, um, maintaining broad and diverse public support is critical, but what does that look like? Um, and, and, and is it statewide? Is it regional? And, and those sort of things. Um, I mean, I, our, our, our personnel have, have gone to great lengths in many cases to begin to educate their local publics on this disease and, and, and um, propose some, some management actions, but um, it's something that we're still working through, um, how we gauge that public support and when it's okay to proceed with this. So, um, and I guess the take home is, is, is as we're trying to garner public support, 
and implement these projects. We need to do it over a very long term. The progression of this disease is so slow. It's, you know, you can't just implement a hunting season or something like that for two or three years and then go back in and measure prevalence and see if it did any good. Um, you, you basically need to understand what the effects of that management may be over the very long term, or you might be back to square one um, just a few years later. So, And then the last thing I would say is, is that we do, we do recommend CWD management occur at all prevalences. So that's another tricky thing for us to navigate because again, getting back to Commissioner Jolovich's question is how much is this on, on the folks' radar? One thing that we do tend to see, at least here in Wyoming, is, is where, where this disease has long been established, there's a fair amount of public concern because people have seen it impact their hunting opportunities, but where it's on the leading edge and the local publics are not used to seeing it, um, it tends not to be in as much in their, their mind, in the forefront of their mind. So, um, so part of it's an education that we need to embark on, but most, a lot of data will suggest that management is most effective at lower prevalences where you're trying to nip this disease in the bud a little bit. We, we're never going to eradicate this disease, but at least hopefully we could actually in some cases maintain prevalence at a fairly low level and prohibit these herds from, from skyrocketing to the places we've seen in other parts of the state. Um, skyrocketing in terms of, of high disease prevalence. So, um, so with respect to harvest management, um, basically the, the, the three main tenets of harvest management that we would intend to employ would be to reduce buck ratios. And again, this is all where it makes sense. This isn't like an across the board recommendation just to do it blindly across the state but reduce buck ratios, decrease deer densities, and address our hot spots. And most of our strategies you guys will find are primarily focused on deer. And that's, and that's again, because of the discrepancies and prevalences with an elk. And it's not to say we're not concerned about elk because certainly CWD and elk is a potentially a huge issue. Um, but most of our elk herds where we actually have CWD well-established are already under extremely liberal um, harvest prescriptions where we're harvesting high percentages of adult females and things like that. So, um, you know, in a lot of cases, there may not be much more to do, at least in, the, in eastern Wyoming. Um, so, and, and I guess one of the real interesting things as I stand up here today is in talking about the, and hopefully making a pitch for the need for CWD management is the recognition that if of where we're at with the current state of our mule deer herds. Um, anyone that's ever stood up in, in front of a room full of hunters wearing a red shirt and talking about hunting season recommendations um, just has a real good idea of knowing how sensitive this can be. Um, you know, there's, there's not a place in Wyoming where, where folks, whether it's hunters, landowners, outfitters, um, game and fish personnel would like to see more mule deer. And mule deer numbers in a lot of cases are as low as they've they've been in, in recent history. And so, so we recognize the sensitivities behind that. We, you know, we acknowledge that in some cases, implementation of these management strategies may actively suppress herd, herds on a localized level, especially mule deer. Um, and no one wants to see more mule deer. Um, or, well, everyone, I should say, everyone wants to see more mule deer. And so that can be kind of a tough pill for folks to swallow. So we try to approach that with some sensitivity, but also um, trying to target our management actions based on, on those segments of the herd that we feel like need to be most addressed. So I just want to do it to acknowledge that, that it's something that's on the forefront of all of the wildlife managers in this room. Um, I'd also say that proposed management actions can vary in scope and significance. So, so the ones that might grab all the headlines might be um, proposals to increase late season buck harvest over a, a substantial amount of landscape or for higher numbers of bucks, but, but some of the, the management actions that we can implement may be kind of smaller scale, low hanging fruit, whether it's fencing off haystacks where in a little disease hotspot area, or even reducing some buck ratios in a localized area, you know, within the framework of the management um, criteria that we already have in place, just some modest buck ratio reduction. So not every, every management action is going to, is going to, be this full scale, you know, massive um, harvest management strategy. And then, uh, you know, one of the other things is, is we're, we're broadly considering white-tailed deer here. As, as Hank alluded to, um, you know, prevalence in white-tailed 
can can either meet or exceed that of mule deer. And, and in a lot of cases, and, and we all know, white-tailed deer tend to be far more productive than mule deer. And in, even in the face of declining mule deer populations, there are parts of the state where whitetail are still doing extremely well. Well, there's a, there's a few things we can learn from implementing these strategies with respect to whitetail, and, and that is, you know, whitetail will face um, periodic die-offs. Like in, in my part of the world, in my region, we lost a ton of whitetails this last year from epizootic hemorrhagic disease. So that kind of reset the clock, so to speak, on this herd. And, and it, it's basically kind of like a, a mother nature treatment for us, um, you know, akin to like, say, a severe winter loss. And so it'll be interesting to see what we can learn from, from measuring prevalence on down the road after, after we lost such a substantial part of that herd. In other cases, um, uh, we're looking at addressing white-tailed deer densities, whether it's the Bighorn Basin or the, the Sheridan Buffalo regions, where we get some extraordinarily high densities of, of whitetails, and those whitetails may be kind of a, a harbinger of this disease and, and playing a role in, in increased by their, you know, environmental transmission to, to the same overlapping mule deer herds. So, so those are just a few reasons why we're, we're really broadly considering um, some treatments with respect to whitetails. So what's going on to date? So that was kind of a, just a, a real short, and, I don't know if it was short, but a, a quick little synopsis of uh, of the CWD management plan. So as, as far as what's going on today, um, so, so one of the main tenants again is to reduce buck ratios. So um, some things that are being proposed now, so our paint rock herd, which for those of you that may not know, that's up in that kind of gray bowl country up in the, in the Bighorn Basin. Um, our Cody region is, is proposing this year a modest late season um, increase in type one, well, increase in type one late season tags for just an increase of, of buck harvest. Um, and there's a few other things I'll get to on the next slide. And then, and again, as you guys would have seen in the Hunter comments, our, our Laramie region um, proposed uh, a suite of 100 um, late season type one November hunts in their sheep mountain mule deer herd, and also some increased buck harvest in their hunt area 60, which is between Cheyenne and Laramie. Um, those proposals were, were withdrawn, um, feel like need to, to, to go back to the drawing board a little bit and, uh, um, and, and I guess garner some more public support, do a little bit more education with the public and that sort of thing. Um, they, you know, they did feel like they laid a lot of groundwork with their local publics, but this was an interesting case in point where you know, they vetted a lot of this proposal through their local mule deer initiative and things like that. Felt like they had good support, so they felt comfortable moving forward with it. But as it came out kind of statewide, there was kind of a groundswell of concern and opposition. Um, and, and so that's just something we're going to go back to the drawing board and, and again, try to better define what public support means for that. Mr. President, Justin, what levels of, you know, your uh, prevalence do you feel that some of this late season strategy will, will, will keep and maintain that prevalence at that lower rate? And then what levels do you think are, you know, where it's almost lost, so to speak? Where, yeah, so that, I mean, that's President or Commissioner Duby, that's a good question. So, so I guess, it, and it's a tricky one to answer because we don't really know, right? So, I mean, it, everything suggests that when you're, when you're implementing these strategies and herds with like, say, less than a 5% prevalence, they're more likely to be successful because the cat's not totally out of the bag at that point. Um, and when you get to these really these higher prevalences, it, it may be too late. And we, we don't know it to a certainty, but there's some there's still some modeling and some analysis that we've been a part of where we've looked at some things that have gone on in Wyoming and in other states that suggest reducing buck ratios and reducing the number of those mature bucks may be promising. And, and all signs would point to where it could there there is a potential for it to reduce prevalence of that disease over the long term. But whether or not that, that threshold is at 15% or 25%, we don't know. And that's the challenge with this is, is, is trying to, to pitch this to the public with that uncertainty. But based on what we do know about the disease, I feel like it's, it's something we're trying and formally evaluating. Yeah, I mean, I, it looks to me like, I mean, where you have, where you wanna do the programs, the prevalence is lower and people aren't buying in, but we're, where, the, where they are buying in is where the prevalence is extremely high and it may be lost. Yeah, and that's- So you're the, kind of in a conundrum there trying to get the public support on that. 
I think yeah. I think that's well said. So so the next um, potential management strategy is reducing deer densities with a goal of either decreasing or stabilizing prevalence and, and, and addressing some hot spots. Um, getting back to the same herd near Grable, the paint rock herd, in conjunction with some modest um, increased uh, type one licenses for reducing buck ratios, um, our Cody region intends to, to increase some mule deer doe harvest in a portion of the herd. This is a pretty interesting case in point where you have, you have a um, difference within this herd unit of resident deer versus migratory deer that actually summer up in the bighorns. And those resident deer we're finding out are, you know, have a much higher prevalence of CWD because they're living year round, whether it's in hay fields or sugar beet fields or things like that, um, compared to that migratory segment. And so they're trying to address the segment of the herd that's exhibiting the highest prevalence um, and hopefully protect that migratory segment for the long term. And, and in conjunction with that, they're planning to, to significantly ramp up white-tailed deer harvest. Um, in our Sheridan region, just kind of across the board, it's been going on for, for years now, but um, continuing to just liberalize and, and try to in, in liberalize whitetail seasons and, and try to incre white, increase whitetail harvest. Um, also in the Southwest Bighorns near Thermopolis, they're proposing you know, tripling <coughs> their whitetail deer harvest from where they've been at recently. And then as Daryl Lutz attested to, um, the land or region here in, in, in our project herd, which is, which is all that unincorporated land within the Wind River Indian Reservation, um, where we have just this extraordinary pre prevalence of, depending on what years you look at it, you know, well over 60% of our mature bucks are testing positive. Um, they're planning to, to maintain deer harvest in such a way that's going to reduce the population for current number, from current numbers. And um, that's, a, that's another place where where you know, our, you know, both the Cody region, what they've proposed in the Bighorn Basin and our Lander region have also put a ton of work in with their local publics and um, garnered a lot of local support for what they're doing. So some, again, I, I keep coming back to the need to, to, to garner public support and, and our public outreach efforts. So um, we've got a lot more coming down the pipe here this next year. So, um, you know, I, I guess it's fair to say that over the past two years, we, we haven't done on a statewide scale as much CWD outreach in terms of, of, of really trying to message the impacts of this disease to our deer herds. Um, you know, we, we passed the plan in July of 2020. You know, it was in the midst of COVID, things like that. A lot of things kind of just got put on hold. We've done a ton of messaging with respect to the need to, to get samples and um, and, and build our sample sizes, Hank's data attested to, but, but we feel like we need to kind of re-engage with the public on a little bit bigger scale to, to again, try to message these places where we, where we know that this disease is actually impacting our herds. And part of that outreach and also trying to foster support for some plan management, we're looking at, at continuing some efforts that our Laramie region folks have done down in Southeast Wyoming and some of that Wheatland country. Um, uh, there's ongoing multiple efforts that have occurred throughout the Bighorn Basin. Um, uh, some additional outreach planned in KC, Douglas, Gillette, Sheridan, and then, and again, some enhanced statewide communication efforts coming down the pipe. So, I, you know, we basically really enhanced our surveillance. I'm, I'm gonna actually skip over a bunch of this because I think Hank covered it pretty well. But with respect to the mandatory sampling, so based on the success that our Lander region had last year, we are intending to kind of take that show on the road just a little bit in, in areas where we feel like attaining our sample size goals may be a little bit tricky based on just logistics of, of how those areas are hunted or, or for various reasons. And so um, and due to the positive response we had last year, we're, we're intending to, to extend that. And that would be in hunter, deer hunt areas 59, 60, 64, 65, 157, and 171. And, and again, this, this more you know, in, intensive surveillance will better help us identify hot spots and, and things like that. Um, one of the other things that we did was, which was a, a direct recommendation from the CWD collaborative process was, was trying to do what we could to incentivize CWD sample collection. So we had a, a large scale statewide raffle last year for hunters that submitted um, tissue samples for testing. 
were automatically enrolled in a raffle. Um, by all measures, it was it was pretty darn successful, and we we feel like it really helped bolster our sample sizes. And and of course, our department employees are, have an expectation that 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 they do what they can to to garner as many samples as they can. So. So one of the other tenets of the plan are just addressing some agency regulatory action. So, so some of those things could be like, like um, promoting feeding bans. You know, over the years, we've been successful in establishing feeding bans in various municipal municipalities around the state. One of the, you know, one of the big potential vectors for this disease can be where we have these really high artificial sources of concentration and folks feeding animals. It just, you know, it's right for both environmental contamination and, and animal to animal contact. So. Um, so trying to address that where we can, um, and then, you know, removing and testing cervids, showing signs of CWD, that's just something that we do routinely anyway. Um, it's especially important in our leading edge areas where, um, where we're still trying to detect this disease in new areas, but, but anytime our folks get calls from a landowner or a member of the public that, hey, there's a sick deer, there's a sick elk walking around, we do our level best to get out there, euthanize the animal, submit it for testing, and get it off the landscape. Carcass disposal, we, we've um, in, engaged in various partnerships to, to kind of ensure proper carcass disposal. Uh, and that's, you know, with CWE in mind, just to try to limit the distribution and prevalence and, and just prevent really people hauling carcasses around the state, which can be a potential source of infection. So we've, you know, we've done some cost sharing with the Fremont County Solid Waste District um, at no cost to, to, to the public, um, assisting in, in finding solutions for other communities where landfills have closed, that's, that's another challenge that we're facing. Um, there's, there's landfills and transfer stations across the state that have closed just for various reasons. And so trying to do what we can to try to facilitate proper carcass disposal from our hunting public. Um, Sundance is a good case in point where we're, we're currently working with the city of Sundance to try to get something in place for, for their local public. Um, uh, our Sheridan region engaged in a really successful dumpster program in Buffalo and Dayton with some other folks like BLM and things like that. And we were able to get some, some large dumpsters out on the landscape. Um, now, and I'm almost done, I'll be kind of quick through this, but now we're gonna, one, one of the last things in the plan that we really committed to was, was not only conducting CWD research as an agency here in Wyoming, but also staying abreast of emerging research throughout the state, throughout the country and even the world. And so, um, You'll, you'll see from the next few slides, there's actually quite a bit going on here within the state. Um, one of the projects that we have going on is, is right now we're looking at the influence of mountain lion predation and, and just general CW, CWD dynamics and mule deer, which includes fawns, um, which is kind of a significant piece. We're, we're trying to actually monitor um, differences in, in adult female survival, fawn survival, their distribution, et cetera, based on CWD positive versus negative animals. And really trying to get a better understanding of when when you have high levels of mountain lion predation in the face of chronic wasting disease, is is that predation helping mitigate this disease by removing infected animals on the landscape, or or is that predation an additive source, meaning a deer herd that's already struggling from disease, or and then subjected to a high level of mountain lion predation, kind of getting it from both ends, and so just trying to better understand um, that mechanism that's going on there. Um, up in Hunter Area 164 in the Bighorn Basin, plans to, to um, uh, collar up to 60 mule deer does. Um, these next several are kind of cut from the same cloth in terms of, you'll see where our local managers are wanting to, to get some just basic herd demographic data by collaring these animals, um, trying to CWD test all the mortalities, um, better understand you know, migratory versus resident um, deer movements and habitat use and survival rates. And the goal, the ultimate goal behind some of these projects is just as they can better understand the demography and the movements of this, these herds is to then, you know, better inform their prospective management strategies on the down the road. Next one would be, our, we're calling it, you know, the Upper Wind River Mule Deer Project, which is again, that project herd becomes kind of a mouthful saying the project, project herd. Um, but uh, um, here, you know, in conjunction with the management that our lander region is already implementing, um, 
you know, they're, they want to call her deer and again, better understand some of those, those same types of movement and demography data um, to see what we can learn. And, and this is a really, this project's a really good case in point where we're talking about really formal evaluations of these management actions and, and something that hopefully can be, you know, not only help us learn statewide what works, what doesn't work, but also disseminate that information outside the state. Um, you know, where Upper Powder River, um, our Upper Powder River study that's recently concluded. This is another kind of poster child for just some of the impacts that we've documented here in Wyoming from persistently high levels of CWD. Um, there, you know, I think they've collared a total of somewhere around 130 some deer over the last three years. Unfortunately, they've actually lost 65 of those deer over the course of that three year study and, and just clinical chronic wasting disease was the was by far the leading cause of death in terms of animals that just laid down and died without a mark on them. Um, uh, survival rates were incredibly poor. So, I mean, it was kind of depressing to learn this, but it, it's, it's again informing us of when we have prevalences high enough, just how bad things can be. Commissioner Duby. Mr. President, you know, I've helped collar a lot of those deer and I was really surprised. We, we collared one doe. The whole team was there. I mean, she was fat. She looked great. She looked really good. Nobody had any inclination. And within a week, she was dead. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing how that can happen. And one minute they look fine, the next minute they're done. So, I mean, just to the personal, it's hard to tell looking at a live deer out there unless they're in that clinical stage. And it can happen fast. Yeah, and, and I think Hank, Hank would tell anyone that would listen, you know, you know, if, if you assume an average incubation period of the disease of say 18 months, um, it, it can vary based on genetics and things like that, but we'll call it 18 months. They really don't exhibit those clinical signs, at least as far as what a human can detect in terms of drooling, emaciation, being skinny, behavioral awareness till the last six to eight weeks, really the last two months. And, and the amount, like, I, I think Hank likes to I always say literally 90 plus percent of the hunters that get a, a, a letter or notification from our lab that their animal tested positive are shocked to hear that because they appeared healthy and happy. But once they do start to go downhill, they go downhill really fast. Another study that kind of emerged based on some public comment um, through our, our, our collaborative process was, was there some thoughts out there that the role of, of um, salt sites, mineral licks um, could be playing a potentially significant role in environmental contamination and transmitting this disease as you have multiple mouths occurring on these salt licks and licking the same piece of salt or mineral or whatever could be a source of, of, of infection within the herd. And the hope behind this was that, hey, this low hanging fruit to potentially address um, with our, our friends in the ag community. Um, you know, there's some, some evidence that suggests that salt and mineral that contains manganese, um, prions can actually more readily bind to manganese and, and most of that stuff does contain it now. So, so looking at is what we're trying to do with this study is actually just to kind of evaluate how much cervid use there really is with some of these salt sites. So it's a pretty large scale, just trail camera study where we're monitoring deer and elk use of salt mineral sites. And then and then we have these livestock excluders that, that cows can readily be trained to access by just flipping a lid up, but deer and elk just tend not to use it, just won't use it. So as we put some of those excluders out on the landscape, the goal is then to look and see how deer and elk react to that you, through both collared animals and, and unmarked animals. So today, you know, they've captured over a million photos and there's a sweatshop somewhere of, of grad students, I think, going pouring through photos of cows and deer um, trying to see what they can come up with. Um, so last two slides. So real quickly, um, and Hank, or excuse me, Dr. Allen can, can talk a little bit more to this, but some of the stuff that's going on our, our Sibula, our Tom Thorne, Beth Williams Wildlife Research Center is, is just looking at the timing of, of prion shedding um, with the genotype of elk. Just a, a real quick nutshell on this is, is depending on your genetic makeup, deer and elk, sometimes can live twice as long as, as most of the deer and elk that get that disease. And so a lot of folks think that's instantly good news and, and hopefully it is, don't know that for sure. But one of the potential implications of that is those animals that have that genotype could also, because they survive twice as long with the disease, 
they might also be shedding it for twice as long in the environment. So it's interesting to think about the implications of that. So the goal of that is just to try to try to examine when that shedding occurs and, and just better understand that. Um, and then um, they're also looking at, at, at a serological, just basically an immune response following it, just a novel CWD vaccine. And if you guys have any questions on that, I'll defer that one to Dr. Allen. And then the last slide. So um, uh, one of the things that's gonna be planned is, is there was a little bit of modeling work that's trying to get at, at, at just the general disease transmission dynamics of, of chronic wasting disease on our elk feed grounds. And so, you know, that's certainly, that's certainly critical as this disease is marched to, to Northwest Wyoming. Um, uh, and so, yeah, basically trying to better understand, you know, utilizing existing movement migration data, things like that, um, how different an management actions could potentially affect prevalence on those elk feed grounds. And with that, any questions? I have one question. How is the, uh, you mentioned the whitetail, how, how are the landowners, because notoriously the whitetail are gonna stick to rounds, the landowners for the most part, how are they receptive to this? Um, President Roberts, member of the commission, Director Nisvik, I guess that would be, um, that would be a question for the local managers. I mean, I guess my experience would suggest that most landowners with respect to whitetails have a, a, a fairly, I guess, um, I guess their attitude is, is they generally support pretty liberal whitetail management. Um, there, there still tends to be some consternation with whitetails in terms of, and I think it's, I, I think a lot of it stems from the fact that they do tend to occupy creek bottoms and hay fields year round, but also concern. There's always this perception that whitetails are competing or out competing with mule deer. And so generally, in my experience, landowners are pretty receptive to increase whitetail harvest about wherever they occur. Mr. President, Justin, uh, a question I have is, we talk about taking care of the, the large bucks, eliminating some of that, but what are we doing to take care of or try to find out about what's happening in an environment where this prion can live for, we heard today, what, 16 years? So if you, you take a herd down number-wise, and then naturally you hope it grows back up, what's gonna keep the new growth from causing the same problem in the future? Yeah, Commissioner Ladwick, that's a great question. And, and I think it's a tough one. It's a tough nut to crack because it gets back to kind of is, is, the, is the cat already out of the bag in these areas where we have really high prevalence. And we do know that environmental contamination likely plays an increasing role, but we, we don't know the extent to which it does. Um, obviously all signs point to the fact that it or not to the fact, but, you know, to the likelihood that it probably does, but we don't know. The tough thing about trying to measure CWD or prions in the environment is the technology is just not there. Dr. Allen's going to talk a little bit about the new RT quick assay that, that came up, which is a far more sensitive test. And, and there's some preliminary work that, well, not even preliminary, there's some work that's been done that shows that, that prions can be detected in soil even so far as to, to say that, you know, prions more readily bind to clay soils versus sandy soils, like that sort of thing. So work's being done on that. It's also being done to try to, to, try to look for prions and feces. Um, but those, the, the tests require so much sensitivity and, and it's, just, it's, it's just really difficult to apply over, over a landscape. And I don't know that we're there. We're definitely not there yet. And I'm not sure that we'll ever get there. Thank you. Mr. President, I have a question. <clears throat> Justin, I always enjoy your, your presentations. They're very informational for me. I'm not familiar with the project herd unit and it was at 66% prevalence in mature bucks. Is that right? That's correct. How long did it take to get there? You know, uh, Commissioner Brokaw, if I could, I could bring up Daryl Lutz to probably better answer your questions with respect to that. I appreciate that. Why is coming up? I'm watching the the sheep mountain herd, and I was at the department's public meetings, and and they're they're resistant to some CWD management, but it wasn't very long ago, three four years. We we're at seven percent, 
Now we're at 15%. How, how fast does this grow if we do nothing? Does it become exponential? Well, Commissioner Brokaw, I think you make a, a, a good point and observation. I mean, you know, I guess hindsight's always 2020. And, and I'm certainly not pointing fingers collectively at the game and fish department because we just didn't know so much about this disease for decades. But we do know that doing nothing has has really not gotten us anywhere. I mean, this disease has marched across the state. And and now while the project herd is the new poster child for a high prevalence herd unit, not too long ago, it was one of my herds in the Casper region um, in the Douglas country. But we also have some extraordinarily high prevalences up by Sheridan and throughout a lot of the Bighorn Basin. So, so it used to be just a few pockets of the state had these really high 30, 40 plus percent prevalences, but now it's, that's just not the case anymore. And uh, I'm sorry, Joe. So one last thing I would add too is, is in, in Colorado, their CWD management plan essentially tells them if when prevalence exceeds 5%, we're going to, we're going to conduct management. And what that means can mean different things in different herd units, but it typically involves enhanced buck harvest and things like that. But they also try to, to maintain whatever management actions that they implement within the frameworks of what they have. So, so in a herd, you might manage for a range of buck ratios. Well, their, their goal is to take that to the lower end of that acceptable range. And, and they really feel like going down these roads these, that they have, that they've kept CWD prevalence at bay in a lot of herds that would have otherwise got out from under them. Commissioner Brokaw, Commission Director Nesvik, with regard to how quickly it, it increased to where it is in the project herd, bear in mind that once we first detected it, then we started doing more surveillance. So keeping that in mind, um, but it, it increased quickly and, and it increased from one or two detections. I think it was probably in about 2012 or 2013 mm -hmm. to what it is now. So within the scope of 10 years, it's gone from very little to a whole heck of a lot. Mm -hmm. So in those areas with the higher prevalence, like your project herd and Justin's Douglas herd, now what's the public perceptive perception for some CWD management? Well, I can tell you that in the project herd, we've, we've been talking to our publics over the last two season setting processes and at least based on the input that we got at our Riverton meeting um, this past month, I, I can't say that people are overly tickled about the idea of, of continuing to reduce that mule deer herd, but at least the folks that showed up at that meeting, I think are, are at least um, supportive of the idea of trying to control CWD to the extent we can. But I don't think they like the idea of fewer, well, I know they don't like the mm -hmm. idea of fewer mule deer. So it is going to be a tough sell, I think. Mm -hmm. But where we've already seen a dramatic decline in mule deer, probably because primarily because of CWD, seems like they're more 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 agreeable. They I think they see more value in trying to do something because the alternative is probably the same result with fewer mule deer. Thank thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. While we're waiting, here we go. Uh, President Roberts, Director Nesvik, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Sam Allen. Um, and for those that don't know, I am the department and the state's wildlife veterinarian. I directly oversee our wildlife health laboratory and our Thorne Williams captive research um, center. Um, and I am also incredibly passionate about wildlife disease. So much so that when I think back on my life, it's probably why some of my relationships didn't go the way they should and maybe why I'm not so popular at parties. Um, but keeping that in mind and that not everyone gets up on Saturday and reads the newest and greatest that comes out, we're trying to keep this kind of at a higher level and I also don't have a ton of time. So that kind of spares you with some of the nitty gritty. But today I'd like to go over some exciting updates from my perspective, and then mainly focus on detection because that's a really big question that we get a lot of. How can we detect CWD in animals? 
what are we using, and then RT Quick. So that's mainly where I'm going to keep it today. So just as a quick reminder, we've already really done this today. So this is all you're going to get. Oh, we went too far. So when we talk about CWD, we're mainly talking about elk, moose, and deer. Those are the ones that we tend to think of the most that get CWD. We're talking about a prion, so we know that's a misshapen protein. Um, we're talking about something that's transmissible and contagious, and that becomes important when we talk about different detection methods. Um, and then it's a chronic disease, so that's also something to keep in mind. And as Justin did a really good job before, this is something that takes a long time to cause disease for animals to die, but it also takes a long time for it to kind of go over the landscape. So the first mule deer again in Wyoming is 1985, and you can kind of see how it's spread out across Wyoming. And then when we're talking about end stages of disease, we're looking at neurological signs, um, stumbling. I'm thinking about my uncle at a party after a few beers, not really knowing where his feet are. Um, and weight loss is something typically people think of. So one of the tricky things with detecting CWD is it's not like our typical viruses, our bacteria. It doesn't have DNA and RNA. So that's typically what we go to grab when we're trying to identify these things using molecular tests or other kind of cellular methods. But there's three main things that we're using right now to try and detect it. One of it is called animal bioassays. This is not something that we typically do um, in our group, but other people do. Um, you're basically taking mice that are genetically predisposed to getting CWD and you're infecting them and watching them over kind of the long or short run. Um, these are very slow and they don't typically reflect natural uh, infection because we're using mice and not so much cervids. There's antibody and antigen tests. So this is what we do use in our lab right now. And for surveillance, it's called NELISA. Um, we're basically looking for kind of those cellular changes. Um, IHC is another method, and this is just looking at cells on a slide. So these are the two main ones that we're using right now. These are using invasive or post-mortem samples. And then finally, you know, what's coming down the pipe a bit more are these amplification assays. So there's something called PMCA. But we're also talking about RT quick, and that's what I'm going to get into a little bit more soon. Um, these typically use post or anti mortem samples, so that's dead or alive, um, and they can sometimes be using non invasive samples. So, when we're talking about post mortem samples, so these are dead animals, um, we're looking at tissues like the brain stem, so the obex, that's very hard to get from a live animal if you want to keep it alive. Um, retropharyngeal lymph nodes, which is kind of the common thing that we ask everyone to grab, and then tonsils and deer are another option in these cases. And the tests, again, like I said, we're looking typically at IHC, which is looking at cells on a slide. We're looking at an ELISA, which is a laboratory test, which is being done in this picture here. Um, so we're looking for that color change reaction. And then RT Quick and PMCA are kind of coming along. And these have been used with varying success. Um, and use, but these are not ones that we typically go for because they're not approved by the USDA. So this isn't something that we can automatically grab to right now because they're new and they're coming on the scene and they're not kind of our old faithful gold standard. Now, as far as anti-mortem testing, um, what we typically grab for is rectal tissue. I'm, I'm sure you've heard people talk about Remalt all the time. Basically, it's this kind of lymphoid tissue that's kind of in between the rectum and the large um, intestine. And it's kind of the small junction area that you're grabbing. Um, there's a bunch of follicles in there and prions tend to deposit in that area. So that's a typical test that we conduct. Um, tonsils is another one in deer that people tend to grab as well. Now the tests there, um, again, IHC and ELISA are commonly used, but also this is where RT Quick and PMCA are coming more on the scene. The sensitivity is increased in a lot of these cases, so this is why we're kind of splitting samples sometimes to see if it's usable. Um, these pictures here is of our group grabbing um, that rectal tissue to perform um, testing on these deer. You get really in the nice glamorous part of the deer. So it's a fun day. So what is RT Quick? And again, I, I don't want to make anyone sad, um, so I'm going to keep it you know, as quick as I can. So there's three main steps here. 
with RT Quick. The first one is you're going to take a substrate that you either bought or you made. You're going to take your sample and you're going to mix that together. So that's the first step right off the bat. The second part is you're going to then incubate it on the, something we called a shaker plate. And that's basically shaker is right in the name. So it's continuously shaking the sample and breaking down those bonds so that they can then merge together and amplify. And then finally is that last cycle where you're getting an amplification. So you can't identify it if you don't amplify it because if it's too small an amount, you're not gonna pick it up. So basically what this test does, is it allows that prion in your sample, if it is there to amplify and spread so that you can send a nice light on it and kind of shine brightly that yes, you have CWD. And the bonus with RT Quick is you can have a smaller amount there and you can still pick it up. So that's kind of the major win with RT Quick. So why would you want to use RT Quick? How is it, you know, super cool and coming out? It's very sensitive, like I just said. And in a lot of studies, they've picked up cases earlier in the course of disease than just by using an ELISA or an IHC. And in some of these cases, it's been about four months earlier than you would typically have picked it up normally. And that might not seem like a lot, um, but if you're a hunter and you want to eat this animal or you're trying to do management options, that extra four months and picking it up earlier could mean a lot. It can be faster and cheaper in some cases. Um, lymphoid tissue right now, when I'm talking lymphoid, I'm talking lymph nodes and brainstem is taking about 24 hours to run. Um, it's way faster than those mouse models I was talking about. And, you know, it's comparable to some of the other ones, but slightly faster. And you can use different tissues and antemortem tissues, um, you know, feces, blood and muscle. It provides more flexibility. However, there's still a lot of work to be done in those non-lymphoid type tissues. What are some of the challenges? It still takes time, right? This isn't an automatic thing that you can just kind of shake your tube and all of a sudden, you know, you know if it's CWD positive or not. The protein on that substrate I talked about where you're mixing it with your sample in the first step can be really expensive to purchase. And if you don't wanna buy it, it can be tricky to make. So it's something where you need a bit of a chemistry degree to kind of put that together. Feces, ear and urine still needs more work. And I'm gonna talk about a couple of papers when I get this is kind of the new, new and exciting, you know, papers we want to present to you. Um, but there needs to be work there because there's a ton of things called inhibitors and they're basically blocking our ability to amplify in some of these cases, but that's being worked through. It's just going to take a little more time. And then we need dedicated lab space and equipment, which is also not cheap. So you need people that have, you know, learned this program, how to identify it when it's been amplified and how to kind of put everything together. So what are kind of our next steps with RT Quick? Um, there is definitely potential future use here with this. There still needs to be validation, especially in comparison to the programs we've already established like ELISA and IHC. And while lymphoid tissue right now, everyone feels very confident in using this, it's the non-lymphoidal tissue types that we continuously need to improve and work on because these are the ones that we're really excited about, right? Can we take a piece of muscle in the field and use that? Can we take an ear punch? You know, could we collect feces? So these are the ones that we're still trying to work on and kind of work through. Okay, so I can stop here quickly with questions or I can power on into some, some of the new research and talk about that. Power on. Power on, here we go, all right. So this isn't a complete lit review. I'm just presenting you with four papers um, with our CWD management group. We try to talk about new research when it comes out. So these are four we thought would be of interest. So I'm gonna start off with testing. We just spoke about it. So it's a good time to follow up with it. And there are two in particular that I'm gonna give you a bit of a snapshot on. One is Ferreira and all, and this one is looking at CWD in mule and white-tailed deer using RT Quick, and this is using the ear. So this is the ear punch one. The second paper on here is Christensen, and this is a field deployable diagnostic assay for visual detection of these prions. And this is using RT Quick. So they went into the field and took a sample and tried to see, you know, is this possible? So for Ferreira, um, so the main objective here was, can we come up with an alternative in live animals um, to sampling from rectal tissue um, or these kind of more invasive tissue types. Um, and they went down the road of ear punches. 
So they selected different spots on the ear and you can kind of see the one to seven on there. Um, some areas of the ear were far more uh, successful than others. And this was in comparison to your typical uh, rectal sample as well. And they found it pretty comparable across the board. However, the most successful one was that number seven right there, which is right on that auricular nerve. Um, but that was the one that was most consistent. So a lot of work, and even what the authors have said that, this still needs continual validation and trying to find maybe a less painful or less you know, invasive area on the ear, which is work that is happening and ongoing right now. Now for Christensen, um, this group used gold nanoparticles, which was something that I was not used to before, but they mixed that technology with RT Quick. And basically, if you remember that slide I showed you with all the stuff on it, but that test tube, they collected muscle from the field from 13 white-tailed deer. They put it into that tube with these gold nanoparticles and the RT Quick technology. They waited the 24 hours um, and they were actually able to see color change after that um, 24 hours to see, you know, is this positive or is this negative? Oh, sorry, they use lymphoid tissue, not muscle. Um, so they feel pretty confident that, you know, they can get this to potentially a field assay because, you know, they collected in the field, they brought it back to the lab and it changed color after those 24 hours. Um, one of the main things that they have to work through right now, though, is trying to understand that color technology and how that actually occurred. So while they compared these results with your typical ELISA and IHC, and they had 100% match up with what was positive and what was negative, they still don't really understand how the gold nanoparticles and the RT Quick work together in that case. So that's something that they're working on right now. And then as far as management and disease, um, a quick snapshot of the Connor et al. paper. And this is looking at the relationship between harvest management and CWD prevalence trends in Western mule deer herds. So this was a retrospective. And when I mean retrospective, it's kind of a back in time um, where they collected harvest data from 2000 to 2017. Um, and this was looking at population and CWD prevalence data from 36 male mule deer herds from four states and one province. In 32 herds, it was found that the amount of harvest of adult males was related to CWD prevalence, so higher harvest, lower prevalence, and if prevalence was less than 5% at the start of the analysis period. In higher prevalence herds, the number of hunters, so the pressure in the two years prior was most influential, but unfortunately, there isn't a clear relationship for the herds that are above that 5% prevalence. So Commissioner Doobie, this kind of falls, or was it Commissioner Brokaw? It falls you know, between that question of asking for prevalence. And then finally, um, I'm gonna end this with a little human dimension work because there were you know, some questions on here on how does the public react? How do they feel about CWD? Um, Schroeder and all 2021, I think it's a very good paper looking at the, you know, coping response of hunters in southeastern Minnesota. So I kind of put some excerpts on here, but basically um, the study occurred in southeastern Minnesota. They sent surveys out to hunters that were in their CWD management zone and to hunters that were outside of their CWD management zone. And what they really wanted to kind of pick up and see was how are hunters coping with different scenarios? So one of those scenarios was, you know, we identify that CWD can cause human health impacts. Another one was how do you cope if you find out the CWD is in your hunt area? And then how do you cope if you find out the CWD is on the exact property um, that you hunt year in and year out? So some of the main things that came out of it is that um, most hunters indicated that they would cope with CWD by having their deer tested prior to eating the meat. So there was a bit of a shift in that case to, you know, I'm not gonna stop hunting, but I'm definitely gonna get my deer tested. Um, that additionally, um, those that were within the management zone, like the CWD management zone, expressed way more worry and uncertainty and anger um, around CWD than those that were outside of the CWD management zone, which is, you know, a common theme that we kind of spoke about today and that we're seeing as well. And one of the interesting things that the authors brought up was agencies need to really consider budget and staffing because if this is a primary way how hunters are going to cope is 
increased testing with CWD in areas, um, there's kind of a budgetary concern there in the long run. Now, if any of these papers are of interest to you, like I said, it's a very quick snapshot. I'm happy to send them to you. I also do have a couple of copies on me. I just don't have enough for everyone. So if anyone does want a hard copy, I have some too. Thank you. Any questions? I have a question, Mr. President. <clears throat> Dr. Allen, I missed the explanation for why can't we detect if it's shed through feces and urine, why can't we detect it there? So using RT quick or just in general? In general. In general. So the difficulty with it being shed, and I'm sorry, I did this wrong, Commissioner Brokaw. All right. I'm sorry about that. Oh, um, <laughs> one of the issues there is these inhibitors that I kind of, you know, graced over slightly. Fecal matter and urine are full of everything that our body does not want, right? So you're full of a bunch of other things that really get in our way of really targeting those prions. And now for RT quick specifically in feces, they are coming up with a way to add kind of an extra step on that three step process mm -hmm. I showed you to eliminate some of these inhibitors because they're identifying them every time they run something, right? They're picking up something else. So as far as feces is concerned, we're, we're getting there for that. The other issue with it is as far as prion distribution, we're not sure how much is actually being shed in feces either. So if it's not as much as say in saliva or it's not as high a load as in a lymphoid tissue because that's where it's deposited, we're maybe dealing with a really smaller amount of prions too. So that kind of ties into the what's being shed and how much and when question as well. Did that help yeah. at all? Yes, ma'am, thank you. Questions? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. I don't uh, have any blue slips on this particular subject. And what I'll do now is if we could uh, take a five to 10 minute break real quick, and then we'll come back with uh, our, our next item, which will be the start of the season settings.